Thanks very much. Um, good morning. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you today a little bit about nature based jobs and some of the work that we're doing in terms of skills development for the nature based sectors. Um, as you can see from the slide there, I'm working with Peatland Action on workforce planning and development, and I will talk a little bit about peatland restoration today as part of our wider um, work in this area. Um, but we're also going to look at some of the other kind of skills interventions and initiatives that we've taken as part of our response effectively to the CSAP. And I'm also very pleased to introduce Perry, who's come to work with us on an internship, um, who will be talking about one of those initiatives particularly. Um, Nature Scott, uh, just to kind of refresh everybody's mind, was formerly Scottish Natural Heritage, where Scotland's Nature Agency. Um, can I please have the next slide, Emily? Um, so we, we know that nature-based solutions um, to climate change can contribute to about 30% of the reduction of carbon emissions from Scotland. So this is a huge driver and a huge opportunity um, to, to develop skills and jobs in this area, but also to have a real impact on, on the emissions from, from our land and from our seas. Um, some of the drivers of nature-based jobs in the future in, include almost a brand new industry in peatland restoration. Um, the need for natural flood management and river restoration was touched on briefly by Chris there, but there are a huge range of jobs and skills required in that area. Coastal habitat management and blue carbon, marine and coastal ecosystems, sand dune management, all sorts of areas related to our best use of the sea and best use of, of blue carbon habitats. Woodland restoration and creation, a brand new industry effectively developing in terms of green finance um, and the investment mechanisms around that to support that. And also low carbon regenerative farming and, and land use, very relevant to today's audience. Um, and the rapid upskilling of, of land managers to meet some of these climate um, and nature targets. Um, hundreds of advisors needed to, to help people work through some of these things. Next slide, please. I feel like Chris Whitty. Um, so we were looking at um, this area last couple of years and trying to assess the, the types of skills required, the types of jobs required, where they'll be and, and what they'll be. Um, so we carried out an initial assessment of nature-based jobs and skills for Net Zero in 2020, I think it was. 2019-2020. Um, and we found some really interesting and, and probably quite surprising uh, information, um, particularly related to job growth. There's a little infographic there on, on the screen which summarises our, our research in this area, but um, of, of real interest, I think, is the fact that nature-based jobs are, are very nearly 200,000 jobs in the Scottish economy, or 7.5% of total jobs. Um, but in the period 2015 to 2019, nature-based jobs grew at a rate which was five times faster than the growth of, of all jobs, um, and were in fact one third of job growth in Scotland in this period. So there's a, a huge kind of area of work there developing in relation to, to addressing our, our requirements and our needs in terms of nature-based solutions and, and land use change and so on in relation to net zero. And significant further growth we found is, is likely to be required on the back of some of these targets. So particularly, as I've mentioned already, in peatland restoration, woodland creation and so on. But I think the interesting thing to stress is that, that these are not necessarily, I think Liz mentioned it in, in her introduction, these are not necessarily all brand new high tech jobs and they're not necessarily all at the kind of more practical end. They're, they're a really interesting blend of jobs across a whole different range of skills everything from the kind of architects and planners through to you know data analysts and, and satellite specialists but in many cases it's it's the current jobs and skills in the workforce that we already have with adaptations to do things just slightly differently to use new technology to to be a a manager of a, a woodland site maintaining your deer numbers but to be using you know gis data and and sort of satellite imagery and so on to help you do that job more effectively. So, so in many ways, some of the jobs are very much similar to what they are at the moment with the addition of new skills. And some of the kind of key messages I think we have from this is that 
the knowledge and skills already in existence are, are fundamentally important and we're looking to add to those and augment them with new information needed to help address the climate emergency. Next slide please. So on the back of um, that piece of research um, we developed a nature-based jobs and skills action plan. So it's very similar to what was outlined there by Alison in terms of the CSAP. We took our lead from some of those themes and looked at it with a particular nature-based sector's focus, if you like. Um, so we have five themes in that action plan. Um, strategic engagement, which is engaging like this, um, with stakeholders across the board, engaging in the CSAP process and implementation groups with the Skills Action Plan for Rural Scotland um, and more widely. Um, but the, the kind of key point from that, I think, is for, from our point of view, is making sure that nature based jobs are understood and recognised as being a kind of core element of green jobs of the future and a core way in which we'll deliver against some of the targets for net zero and also to address the biodiversity crisis. Um, we have a a strategic theme in there about engaging and inspiring young people. So provision of information about careers, careers guidance and an inspiration as to what kind of jobs of the future are. And at the moment, actually, we have a, a little project in development that Perry is involved in, in too, um, which is developing uh, career resources in terms of videos to help explain a standard day in the life, um, which we'll obviously hope to share um, with my world of work and, and, uh, and more widely. Um, also importantly, understanding demands. So we've been trying to dive a little bit deeper into sort of some of our initial findings and find out, you know, how many jobs in what sectors, what skills are required, what regions will these jobs arise in, um, where, you know, where will they be, um, how best to increase diversity of the workforce, because as we know there are, we know there are skill shortages. We also know that across um, Scotland and UK in general, we also have labour shortages in lots of sectors. Um, and so the importance of, of actually bringing in as diverse a, a workforce as we possibly can is, is a key consideration. Um, we've also tried to understand a little bit better about some of the barriers. And so it's really interesting to hear Mary talk there about the Green Internship Scheme. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that ourselves, because one of the principal barriers that we found through some sectoral research, um, particularly we've done some research in, in riparian sectors to start with, but also some research with um, recent graduates in environmental sciences and, and kind of environmental skills backgrounds to understand some of the issues about bringing new people into the workforce from, from a sort of standing start were about the need for experience and, and how we kind of help to address some of that. So the Green Internship Scheme and things like the, the Graduate Career Advantage Scotland, which was mentioned, are, are really, really important. And as you'll see from what I'm about to describe, we've Kind of trying to address that in some ways ourselves too. Um, peatland restoration is, is a theme of its own in our action plan, um, specifying the amount of work there and the amount of um, shortages in the in the in the workforce and, and how we're actually going to address that. And I'll I'll come to that towards the end of the presentation. Um, but also importantly upskilling the existing workforce. So in terms of land use in terms of many rural sectors. As I said at the beginning, there is a huge amount of, of knowledge, information and experience there. And it's really about trying to um, trying to address some of the, the skills needs of the future um, and add these to the skills of the existing workforce rather than replace any of them. So very much looking at what, what information people need to have going forward and, and how we help um, bring that in. Uh, okay, so next slide, please, Emily. So from an internal point of view, um, we know that Nature Scott is just as likely to uh, struggle with um, skill shortages as anyone else. Uh, we also have, like many sectors, uh, an ageing demographic in our own organisation. So just one brief example here of something that we are trying to do about that is our programme for youth employment, um, which last year involved around 40 um, young people coming into the organisation on short term placements. Um, anything up to two years um, at a range of different levels. So we have some modern apprentices um, right through to um, a graduate careers programme and, and everything in between, um, covering a wide range of roles to do with visitor management, National Nature Reserve management, deer managers working on some of our National Nature Reserves, right through to quite specialist roles in terms of kind of um, data analysis and, and satellite data. Um, 
and green finance as well. Some some really interesting and inspiring work on green finance. And I think the kind of key thing that we've discovered is the huge extent of, of skills and knowledge and enthusiasm in um, in the young employee program um, it has just been incredible and inspiring, but also a really very useful way of bringing in new skills and fresh ideas into the organisation. And um, we're very happy that that many of the people who came in through that programme in the two or three years that we've been running it now have found work either with Nature Scott or in similar organisations, having had that kind of first step up and uh, you know, useful work experience. Next slide, please. So on a, oh, I think, have we missed one? No, we haven't, sorry, I have my notes the wrong way around. So on that point, I'm actually going to hand over to Perry, who's going to tell you a little bit about our Ethnicity in Nature programme. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name's Perry, I'm here on a three-month programme. Um, it's the Ethnicity in Nature programme. It's a pilot programme funded by Nature Scott, and it's working in partnership with SEMBO. So SEMBO is a Council of Ethnic Minority Voluntary Organisation, and they work with quite a few environmental and nature-related organisations, um, because obviously they recognise that there is like an underrepresentation of ethnic minority people within the sector. And um, so placements like this one, where it's a three-month-long uh, paid placement, um, it's just sort of like rear, um, raise awareness of the sector and like try to find what the barriers are and why that sort of underrepresentation exists. So if, uh, with this um, programme that I'm here with, it's four project placements and we're here until the start of April and we're employed by SEMBO but we're working with Nature um, Scott and like different teams on different like various projects like Becky mentioned I'm doing sort of like nature based skills and jobs providing information to stakeholders like SDS and um, regarding nature based jobs and skills. Next slide please Emily. So um, diversity in nature, um, obviously we've been talking about like finding new solutions and changes um, and when people hear diversity they usually probably just think of somebody like me working in like a you know a new environment but doesn't always have to be about ethnicity or like ethnic minority groups only and um, it can also refer to people that don't necessarily have nature-based jobs on the radar so that can also be urban populations but for the sake of this <laughs> I, will, I will focus on ethnicity and nature um, so um, where was I? Yeah, so basically, I know we talk about diversity, but I think one thing we need to consider is that it, diversity isn't always just about trying to add people on for the sake of adding people on. I feel like it should be about representation. So 8.2% um, of the Scottish population is ethnic minority, whereas the workforce does not reflect that. And I can say that from Nature Scott because I think less than 1% of the Nature Scott um, workforce is a minority ethnic. So I think what we need to think about is how we can sort of integrate in, in diversity into the sector and it needs to be more long term solutions. So yeah, temporary uh, placements and think projects like that, they're great to sort of introduce people to the sector. But how can we then translate those into longer term solutions is what we need to really think about. Um, and like Becky mentioned earlier on, there is a shortage of labour and there's a shortage of skills. So I think what we need to think about is how can we make the sector more appealing and accessible to these groups that don't necessarily consider nature based jobs and um, we can maybe think about jobs that they skills that they need and then skills that can be taught. So even if they don't come with all the skills that we need, maybe we can teach them those skills and, you know, um, yeah, so just different ways on how we can make the, need, um, the sector more accessible and appealing to groups that don't consider it um, usually. And um, so I think the thing that I kind of want to leave you guys with is a bit of a challenge. Uh, so two things like the slide mentions. First thing is why do we actually want diversity? Is it just a little tick box or do we actually think that we could do with the diversity of thought from different people, from different, um, you know, like age groups, urban populations, ethnic minorities? Um, and the other thing is how, what can we actually do differently to ensure that we achieve it? Um, like Chris Rosie mentioned earlier on, like the responsibility is on the employers. So um, 
what can you as an employer do to make sure that your organisation is more accessible and appealing to people from different ethnic minority groups? And yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'll pass you back to Becky now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Perry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I hope you can. It's saying I'm not unmuted. Um, could you give me the next slide, please, Emily? Um, thanks, Perry. Perry um, was obviously there describing one of our kind of projects to try and give um, people um, a taste and experience, uh, a view of the careers pathways into nature-based sectors. And, and I'm about to talk about another, um, which is a partnership project with Skills Development Scotland and funded through the National Transition Training Fund. So this is the Working with Rivers Training Placement Scheme. Again, because we've realised that in discussion with um, sector organisations to do with riparian uh, habitat enhancement and river restoration and so on, um, many of whom are very small, um, often one or two man bands. And when they go to recruitment, they need somebody who, when they have a, a budget for a post, and they go to recruit that, they need somebody who's able to hit the ground running relatively quickly because of the cost of the organisation in, in having that person on board, but also because of the kind of, um, potential for mentoring and engagement and training is, is relatively limited if you're just needing someone to come in and join you on that post straight away. So um, we have developed this scheme after discussion with, with riparian stakeholders. Um, next slide, please, Ali. And the intention is to try and bring people in on a paid training placement so that the organisation is able to afford the time um, to spend training and bringing up to speed the kind of um, entrance to the sector who might otherwise not necessarily have thought of roles in the sector. Um, we made it open to any business or organisation that could support skills development and river restoration, natural flood management, control of invasive non-native species and, and other kind of riparian skills, fisheries management and so on. Um, it's a 12 week placement um, and it's aimed at people transitioning into nature-based sectors. So we're talking here about people who may not necessarily either have the skills or have, have particularly thought before about moving into a nature-based sector, but who are interested in learning more and finding out more. Um, we were delighted with the uptake of this offer um, and we've finally been able to offer 20 placements within 15 different host organisations. Most of these host organisations are rivers, trusts and um, fisheries boards, but we also have a common grazing committee, um, we have a university, uh, we have a catchment partnership. Um, so there's, there's a kind of slightly more diverse range of riparian stakeholders here who are all committed to providing um, training and experience on the job which gives people um, a taste of many of the different roles within the organisation um, and an idea of, of how best to, to go about some of this work. There was no level set for a particular skills level. Um, it was about uh, you know, asking each organisation to identify themselves um, what would be the kind of useful, um, useful level at which to engage. So the placements have come in from everything from a very practical, um, outdoor focused kind of level right through to sort of some of the planning and design um, that goes into river restoration. Um, we're offering additional um, training on top of this and particular courses on sort of habitat restoration, on um, fisheries management, on, on planning a river restoration project and so on to give people as much of a taster um, during their 12 week uh, window as we possibly can. The intention obviously being that at the end of this 12 week window people have a much uh, better idea of what it's like to work in the sector, what it's like to work in rivers and riparian management and an idea of some of the careers, pathways and, and skills um, development that they need, need themselves to progress in this if they decide that they want to take this further. Um, and the placements will start uh, anytime in March and they'll all be finished by, by mid-June. So that recruitment is underway at the moment and we're, we're really quite excited about this project. Um, it's quite a new approach in terms of skills development for us um, is to offer this kind of uh, activity that, that is really open to what the host organisation wants and, and focused on the training needs of, of the individual with them. So every organisation will develop a skills training plan and, and share it with, with us in SDS in the first two weeks of, of their employment. So we'll understand 
really well what people are learning and, and their on the job experience. Uh, next slide, please. So in a slightly different vein, um, we also have a piece of work um, on green finance guidance. So we're very aware that there's a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of kind of talk about green finance mechanisms um, and how they use them. And everybody will be aware, of course, of some of the sort of discussions about green lairds and all these kind of things. So we have developed this very introductory piece of guidance, which is trying to set out for the purposes of land managers um, what, where some of the roots are in terms of blending public and private finance to achieve some of the aims that you want to do in terms of investing in, in natural capital and environmental works and so on on your land. Um, so as someone mentioned earlier, the just transition requires that, that no one is left behind. And this is very much an attempt to make sure that everybody has access to introductory level information on, on green finance opportunities and urban markets and so on. Um, this information is going to be updatable um, because green finance mechanisms and kind of market platform for this is, is moving very, very quickly. Um, and it will be, therefore, it will be a, a live on our on our website um, information rather than a printed document. And it's just currently with our web team at the moment and its first iteration will be available in March. So please do keep an eye out for that. We're very keen to have feedback on how useful people have found it, what further information would be required and so on. But effectively, it's not the answer. It's signposting to some of the questions and a kind of introductory way in to consider what some of the things you might need to think about before you were to take up um, engagement in, in green finance markets. And um, so, yeah, please, please do look out for that. Um, now, one of the main green finance mechanisms um, floating around at the moment is, of course, the Peatland Code, which brings me nicely to my next slide. Thank you very much. So, Peatlands cover 25% of Scotland's land cover. 80% um, of peatland in Scotland is degraded. 1.8 million hectares is in poor condition, uh, which effectively means it's, it's not wet enough and exposed open peat is, is losing carbon to the atmosphere. Um, this is a, obviously a real problem in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and is responsible for anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. The science is still a little bit um, to be confirmed, but it's but it's around um, around that mark and certainly at least 10. Um, so obviously, as well as greenhouse gases, uh, it's contributing to the loss of biodiversity and, of course, increasing flood risk um, further downstream. So you can see from a couple of these pictures of, of gullies here that water will run fairly quickly through them, straight down the hill and into the rivers, exacerbating flooding problems, whereas in a healthy peatland, they'll, they'll stay in that nice wet bog um, for a good long time. Next slide, please. So there's a huge opportunity here, and there's a huge opportunity in terms of addressing some of our climate change targets, um, and, but there's also a huge opportunity in terms of jobs and skills. So peatland action, which is a Scottish government scheme managed by Nature Scott, but delivered by a variety of other partners, including Forestry Land Scotland, Scottish Water and the National Parks, um, has been running since 2012. And over £30 million pounds has been spent in that time and 25,000 hectares of degraded peat has been restored. Um, a huge lot of learning has happened in that time, best practice guidance and technical information on how to restore some of these degraded peatlands um, has developed annually almost and is, is being kept up to date in a kind of up to date best practice thing as more and more examples of, of ways that this, this has worked is, are coming on. So there's been 350 projects done, some pretty large scale ones, um, and up by 186 different applicants. So obviously some people have, have multiple sites. Um, the target, however, has gone up significantly in recent years with a Scottish Government commitment to now restore 250,000 hectares of peatland by 2030. So as you can see, that's a pretty significant jump. The graph there demonstrates uh, what we are at at the moment. So the green is peatland action funded so far um, and moving up to where some of our targets are. So the climate plan target Climate plan update target, as you can see, is that kind of line at the top of the pale blue, significantly in advance of where we are at the moment with our, in our little green area that we've already done. 
So there's been some great work already ongoing and lots and lots of learning, but now we're at the stage of really needing to, to grow this as an industry. And there's a huge skills demand in doing that. That one of the most obvious constraining factors in peatland restoration at the moment is, is the lack of people with the skills to do this. So we're looking to jump to at least 20,000 hectares a year, starting effectively now. And there's a really big skills um, requirement in doing this. So what's happened thus far is that training for peatland restoration has been carried out through the Peatland Action Project by our training partners deliver, delivering training on, for the scheme, which is the Crichton Carbon Centre in, in Dumfriesshire. Um, and I've done a, a brilliant job in terms of kind of keeping up to date with all the developing best practice, bringing all that information in, and then running these training events, which are aimed at both scheme designers, um, planning uh, folk from local authorities, and the contractors who will actually deliver the work on the ground. Um, so there are sort of three areas, if you like. There's the kind of demand side, so helping people understand um, peatland restoration. So the mechanism, so peatland action will cover all the capital costs. And then there's access to peatland code, which will provide ongoing payments for carbon, um, which will then drive demand. There's training requirements in terms of the design capacity so we're looking at many many more people with the knowledge of how a peatland functions the ecology and hydrology of a peatland and the techniques that you would require um, to effectively re-wet that peatland so blocking drains creating different kind of dams and buns and and revegetating and, and reprofiling peatlands um, and then the third sort of section of that is the skills required in, in delivering the scheme. So taking the plan developed by the designer um, and, and putting in place all the buns, the dams and the reprofiling. So a highly technical, highly skilled use of, of excavators there. Um, so there's a huge skills requirement. And uh, next slide, please, Emily. And, uh, and that's where we're planning to work very much in the next few years. Is, is working on how to develop and expand this peatland workforce. Um, so I am now officially the peatland action workforce planning and development manager, but this is day five. So I haven't got enormous amounts of insight yet um, as to all the steps that we're going to take, but I can set out a flavor of some of the stuff that we're, we're thinking about already. Um, so as I said, you know, demand, design and delivery, those are the kind of three areas that we need to work on um, to try and, and help provide the kind of skills, information, practical training, accreditation um, that we need to, to have a competent, safe workforce. There are obviously health and safety considerations. There are in environmentally sensitive areas to be considered. There's, there's fairly poor weather, um, remote, remote and exposed sites, all, all sorts of different considerations which require a lot of thought and planning. Um, so our very first kind of step in this new direction is obviously to continue our existing training with the Crichton Carbon Centre, which has been delivering um, training to 270 people already. So almost all the people involved currently in the design and the delivery of the restoration are involved in this um, Crichton uh, Carbon Centre training. But obviously, given the scale of the increase and the scale of the ask, we're looking at a much bigger skills uplift based on that. So our kind of first project is a, a scoping assessment, if you like, of the idea of a free apprenticeship in treatment restoration. This is a partnership between ourselves and Lantra working with North Island College UHI um, to assess the, the potential for, for a Peatland pre-apprenticeship. So that would be looking at providing some of the kind of basic skills that people would need to have in terms of um, outdoor first aid, sort of health and safety, experience of, of working in this kind of terrain and these kind of conditions, um, you know, using vehicles on sensitive areas, um, beginning to kind of work through some of the the thinking and understanding in terms of habitat surveying and monitoring and so on. Um, so it's very much a kind of general introduction to the kind of skills that you would need to then go on to either um, perhaps an apprenticeship with a contractor um, or even moving into a different direction in terms of kind of HNC, HND um, in rural skills, for example, with a kind of peatland element, which could then help you, you know, design and, uh, and create peatland restoration skills. 